Welcome back. Uh, lesson six. So this is our penultimate lesson. Um, uh, and believe it or not, uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago in lesson four, I mentioned I was going to share that lesson with this uh, terrific uh, NLP researcher, Sebastian Ruder, uh, which I did, and he he said he loved it, and he's gone on to uh, yesterday release this. Um, new post he called Optimization for Deep Learning Highlights in 2017, in which he covered uh, basically everything that we talked about in that lesson, um, uh, and with some very nice shout-outs to some of the work that uh, some of the students here have done, uh, including uh, when he talked about this separation of um, um, uh, this separation of weight decay from the momentum term, um, and so he actually mentions here uh, the opportunities in terms of improved kind of software decoupling this allows, and actually links to um, uh, the commit from Anand Sahar actually showing how to implement this in FastAI. So FastAI's code is actually being used as a bit of a role model now. Uh, he then covers um, uh, some of these learning rate tuning techniques that we've talked about, uh, and this is the uh, uh, SGDR schedule. It looks a bit different to what you're used to seeing, because this is on a log curve. But this is the way that they show it on the paper. Uh, and in, uh, for more information, again, links to uh, two blog posts, uh, the one from uh, Vitaly um, about this topic, and uh, and again, Anand Saha, uh, his uh, blog post on this topic. So it's great to see that um, some of the work from Fast AI students is already getting noticed and picked up and shared, and this blog post went on to get on the front page of Hacker News. Um, so uh, that's pretty cool, and uh, hopefully um, more and more of this work will be picked up once this is released um, publicly. So last week we were um, Kind of doing a deep dive into collaborative filtering, and let's remind ourselves of kind of what our final model looked like. So in the end, we kind of ended up rebuilding um, the model that's actually in the Fast AI library, uh, where we had. Um, an embedding, so we had this little get embedding function that grabbed an embedding and randomly initialized the weights uh, for the users and for the items. That's the kind of generic term. In our case, the items are movies. Um, the bias for the users, the bias for the items, um, and we had n factors embedding size for each for each one. Of course, the biases just had a single one. Uh, and then we grabbed the users and item embeddings, multiplied them together, summed it up for each row, and added on the bias terms, um, popped that through a sigmoid to put it into the range that we wanted. So that was our model. And um, one of you asked if we can kind of interpret this information in some way, uh, and I promised this week we would see how to do that. So let's take a look. So we're going to start with the Model we built here where we just used that fast AI library um, collab filter data set from CSV and then that dot get learner and then we fitted it uh, in three epochs um, 19 seconds um, We got a pretty good result um, So what we can now do is to analyze um, that model So uh, you may remember right back when we started we read in the movies.csv file, um, but that's just a mapping from the ID of the movie to the name of the movie. And so we're just going to use that for display purposes so we can see what we're doing. Um, because not all of us have watched every movie, I'm just going to limit this to the top 500 most popular, sorry, 3,000 most popular movies, so we might have more chance of recognizing the movies we're looking at. Um, and then I'll go ahead and uh, change it from the movie IDs from movie lens to uh, those unique IDs that we're using the contiguous IDs because that's what our model has all right so um, inside the uh, Learn object that we create inside a learner 
Um, we can always grab the PyTorch model itself just by saying learn dot model Right and like I'm going to just kind of show you more and more of the code um, At the moment, so let's take a look at the definition of model um, And so a model is a property so if you haven't seen a property before a property is just something in Python which looks like a method um, when you define it, but you can call it without parentheses as we do here right and so it kind of looks when you call it like it's a regular attribute but it looks like when you define it like it's a method so every time you call it it actually runs this code okay and so in this case it's just a shortcut to grab something called dot models dot model um, so you may be interested to know what that looks like learn dot models um, and so this is there's a uh, the uh, the fast AI model type is a very thin wrapper for PyTorch models. So we could take a look at this Collab filter model and see what that is It's only one line of code, okay, and um, Yeah, we'll, we'll talk more about these in part two right, but basically that it's, it's this very thin wrapper and the main thing one of the main things that fast AI does is we have this concept of layer groups where basically when you say here there are different learning rates and they get applied to different sets of layers And that's something that's not in PyTorch. So when you say I want to use this PyTorch model There's with one thing we have to do which is to say like okay, what are our layer groups? Okay, so the details aren't terribly important um, But in general if you want to create a, a little wrapper for some other PyTorch model You could just write something like this um, So to get to get inside that to grab the actual PyTorch model itself It's models dot model. That's the PyTorch model and then the learn object has a shortcut to that Okay, so we're going to set uh, M to be the PyTorch model and so when you um, print out a PyTorch model it prints it out basically by listing out all of the layers That you created in the constructor um, It's quite it's quite nifty actually when you kind of think about the way this works thanks to kind of some Very handy stuff in Python uh, We're actually able to use standard Python OO to kind of define uh, These modules and these layers and they basically automatically kind of register themselves with PyTorch so back in our embedding dot bias We just had a bunch of things where we said okay Each of these things are equal to these things and then it automatically knows how to represent that um, So you can see there's the name is you and so the name is just literally whatever we called it here you right um, And then the definition is it's this kind of layer, okay? So that's our PyTorch model um, so we can uh Look inside that basically use that so if we say m dot IB then that's referring to the embedding layer for an item Which is the bias layer so an item bias in this case is the movie bias so each movie there are 9,000 of them has a single bias element right now the really nice thing about PyTorch layers and Models is that they all look the same they basically to use them you call them as if they were a function So we can go m dot ib parentheses Right and that basically says I want you to return the value of that layer and that layer could be a full-on model right so to actually Get a prediction from a PyTorch model. You just I would go m and pass in my variable Okay, and so in this case m dot ib and pass in my top movie indexes now models remember uh, layers um, they require variables Not tensors um, because it needs to keep track of the derivatives Okay, and so we use this capital V to turn the tensor into a variable um, and it was just announced this week that PyTorch 0.4 Which is the version after the one that's just about to be released um, is going to get rid of variables um, And we'll actually be able to use tensors directly to keep track of derivatives So if you're watching this on the MOOC and you're looking at point four, then you'll probably notice that the code doesn't have this V in it anymore um, 
Um, so that would be that would be pretty exciting when that happens But for now we have to remember if we're going to pass something into a model to turn it into a variable first and remember a variable has a strict superset of the API of a tensor so anything you can do to a tensor We can do to a variable like add it up or take its log or whatever Okay, so that's going to return a variable Which consists of going through each of these movie IDs putting it through this embedding layer to get its bias Okay, and that's going to return a, um, a variable um, Let's take a look uh, So before I press Shift enter here you can have a think about what I'm going to have I've got a list of 3,000 movies going in um, Turning it into a variable putting it through this embedding layer um, So just have a think about what you expect to come out Okay, and we have a variable of size 3,000 by one. Hopefully that doesn't surprise you. We had 3,000 movies that we were looking up. Each one had had a one long embedding. Okay, so there's our 3,000 long. You'll notice it's a variable, um, which is not surprising because we fed it a variable, so we get a variable back. And it's a variable that's on the GPU, right? Dot CUDA. Okay, so. Um, We have a little shortcut in fast AI because we we very often want to take variables Turn them into tensors and move them back to the CPU so we can play with them more easily So 2 MP is is to numpy okay, and that does all of those things and it, it works regardless of whether it's a tensor or a variable It works regardless of whether it's on the CPU or GPU. It'll end up giving you a a numpy array from that okay, so if we do that That gives us exactly the same thing as we just looked at but now in numpy form Okay, so that's a super handy thing to use um, when you're playing around with PyTorch my approach to things is um, I Try to use numpy for everything Except when I explicitly you need something to run on the GPU or I need its derivatives Right in which case I use PyTorch because like numpy like I kind of find NumPy is often easier to work with. It's been around many years longer than PyTorch um, So, you know and and lots of things like, um, like the Python imaging library and OpenCV and lots and lots of stuff like uh, Pandas it works with NumPy. So my approach is kind of like do as much as I can in NumPy land um, Finally when I'm ready to do something on the GPU or take its derivative to PyTorch And then as soon as I can I put it back in NumPy and you'll see that the fast AI library Really works this way like all the transformations and stuff happen in NumPy which is different to most PyTorch computer vision libraries um, which tend to do it all as much as possible in PyTorch. Uh, I try to do as much as possible in NumPy uh, We have a question here Um, so let's say we wanted to transfer build a model in the GPU with the GPU and train it and then we want to Bring this to production. So would we call to numpy on the model itself? Or would we have to iterate through all the different layers and then call to NP? Yeah, good question So it's very likely that you want to do inference on a CPU rather than a GPU It's it's more scalable. You don't have to worry about putting things in batches, you know, so on and so forth um, so you can move a model Uh, onto the CPU just by typing M dot CPU uh, and that model is now on the CPU and so therefore you can also then put your variable on the CPU by doing exactly the same thing so you can say Like so now having said that if your um, if your server doesn't have a GPU or CUDA GPU um, You don't have to do this because it won't put it on the GPU at all So um, if you if, if for inferencing on the server if you're running it on you know some uh, T2 instance or something it'll work fine It'll all run on the on the CPU automatically um, Quick follow-up and if we train the model on the GPU and then we save those embeddings and um, the weights uh, Would we have to do anything special to load it onto the to the No, CPU? you you won't um, We have something well it kind of depends how much of fast AI you're using um, so I'll show you how you can do that in case you have to do it manually um, One of the students figured this out which is very handy um, when we There's 
there's a load model function um, And you'll see what it does but it does torch dot load is it basically this is like some magic incantation that like normally it ha has to load it onto the same GPU it was saved on uh, but this will like load it into whatever's whatever's available so um, that was a handy discovery Thanks for the great questions um, And so to put that back on the GPU I'll need to say dot CUDA And now there we go. I can run it again. Okay So um, it's really important uh, to know about the zip function in Python um, which iterates through a number of lists um, at the same time so in this case I want to grab each movie along with its bias term um, So that I can just pop it into a list of tuples So if I just go zip like that that's going to iterate through each movie ID and each bias term um, And so then I can use that in a list comprehension to grab the name of each movie along with its bias Okay, so having done that uh, I can then um, sort And so here uh, I told you the John, John Travolta uh, Scientology movie at the most negative of ne quite by a lot if this was a Kaggle competition Battlefield Earth would have like won by miles look at this seven 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 ninety six um, So here is the worst movie of all time according to IMDB and like it's interesting When you think about what this means right because this is like a much more authentic way to find out how bad this movie is because like Some people are just more negative about movies, right? And like if more of them watch your movie like a you know highly critical audience They're going to rate it badly. So if you take an average, it's not quite fair, right? Um, and so what this is you know what this is doing is saying once we you know remove the fact that different people have different overall positive or negative experiences and different people watch different kinds of movies and we correct for all that um, This is the worst movie of all time Uh, so that's a good thing to know um, So this is how we can yeah look inside our, our model and 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 interpret the bias vectors um, You'll see here. I've sorted by the zeroth element of each tuple by using a lambda um, originally I used this um, special Um, item getter. This is part of uh, Python's operator library, and this creates a function that returns the zeroth element of something um, in order to save time. And then I actually realized that the lambda is only one more character <laughs> to write than the item getter, so maybe we don't need to know this after all. So um, yeah, really useful to make sure you know how to write lambdas in Python. So this is a this is a function, okay? And so the sort the sort. Is going to call this function every time it decides like is this thing higher or lower than that other thing and this func This is going to return the zeroth element, okay um, So here's the same thing in item getter format and here is the reverse and um, Shawshank Redemption right at the top definitely agree with that Godfather usual suspects. Yeah, these are all pretty great movies um, 12 angry men absolutely uh, So there you go um, There's how we can look at the bias uh, So then the second piece to look at would be the the embeddings. Uh, how can we look at the embeddings? Um, so we can do the same thing. Uh, so remember I was the item embeddings rather than IB was the item bias uh, We can pass in our list of movies as a variable Turn it into numpy and here's our movie embeddings. So for each of the 3,000 uh, most popular movies Here are its 50 embeddings So um, It's very hard unless you're Jeffrey Hinton to visualize a 50 dimensional space um, So what we'll do is we'll turn it into a three-dimensional space um, so we can compress um, High dimensional spaces down into lower dimensional spaces using lots of different uh, techniques um, Perhaps one of the most common and popular is called PCA um, PCA stands for principal components analysis. Um, it's a linear technique um, but um, Linear techniques generally work fine for this kind of um, embedding. Uh, I'm not going to teach you about PCA now, but I will say in Rachel's computational linear algebra class, which you can get to from Fast.ai, um, we cover PCA in a lot of detail. 
um, and it's a really important technique. It actually it turns out to be uh, almost identical to something uh, called um, singular value decomposition, which is a type of matrix decomposition, which actually does turn up in deep learning a little bit from time to time. Um, so it, it's, it's kind of somewhat worth knowing uh, if you were going to dig more into linear algebra, you know, uh, SPD and PCA along with eigenvalues and eigenvectors, which are all slightly different versions of this kind of the same thing, um, are all worth knowing. Um, but for now, just know that you can grab PCA from sklearn.decomposition, say how much you want to reduce the dimensionality to, so I want to find three components, and what this is going to do is it's going to find three linear combinations of the 50 dimensions, which capture as much as the variation as possible, but are as different to each other as possible. Okay, um, so we would call this a, a lower rank approximation uh, of our matrix. All right, um, so then we can grab the components, so that's going to be the three um, dimensions, and so once we've done that we've now got three by three thousand, um, and so we can now take a look at the first of them, and we'll do the same thing of using zip to look at each one along with its movie. Um, and so here's the thing, right? We we don't know ahead of time what this PCA thing is. It's just it's just a, a bunch of latent factors. Um, you know, it's it's kind of the, the 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 main axis in this space of latent factors. And so, but what we can do is we can look at it and see if we can figure out what it's about, right? So given that Police Academy 4 is high up here along with Waterworld, where else Fargo, Pulp Fiction, and Godfeather are, are, are high up here, I'm going to guess that a high value is not going to represent like critically acclaimed movies uh, or serious watching. So I kind of, what did I call this? Yeah, okay, I called this easy watching versus serious. Right? But like this is kind of how you have to interpret your embeddings is like take a look at what they seem to be showing and Decide what you think it means. So this is the kind of the the principal axis uh, in this set of embeddings. So we can look at the next one um, So do the same thing and look at the, the first uh, index one embedding um, This one's a little bit harder to kind of figure out what's going on but with things like Mulholland Drive and Purple Rose of Cairo these look more kind of dialogue-y kind of ones, or else things like Lord of the Rings and Aladdin and Star Wars, these look more like kind of modern CGI-y kind of ones. So you could kind of imagine that on that pair of dimensions, it probably represents a lot of, you know, uh, differences between how people rate movies. You know, some people like, um, you know, Purple Rise of Cairo type movies, you know, Woody Allen, um, Kind of classic and some people like these, you know, big Hollywood spectacles um, Some people presumably like Police Academy for uh, more than they like Fargo um, uh, So yeah, so like you can kind of get the idea of what's happened. It, it's it's done a you know for a model which was um, You know for a model which was literally multiply two things together and add them up um, it's learnt quite a lot, you know, which is kind of cool. Um, so that's what we can do with um, with that, and then we could we could plot them if we wanted to. Um, I just grabbed a small subset uh, to plot on those first two axes. All right, so that's that. So I wanted to next kind of dig in a layer deeper into what actually happens when we say fit, right? So when we said learn.fit, what's it doing? Um, for something like the store model, um, is it a way to interpret the embeddings? For something like the, the, the Rossman one? Yes. Yeah, we'll see that in a moment. Okay. Uh, well, let's jump straight there, what the hell. Okay, so um, so for the um, Rossman, uh, how much are we going to sell at each store on each date um, uh, model? 
Um, we um, this is from the paper uh, Gore and Burkhan. It's a it's a great paper, by the way. Um, well worth you know, like pretty accessible. I, I think any of you would at this point be able to at least get the gist of it, if you know, and much of the detail as well. Particularly as you've also done the machine learning course. Um, and they actually make this point in the paper, this is in the paper, that uh, the equivalent of what they call entity embedding layers, so an, an embedding of a categorical variable, is identical to a one-hot encoding followed by uh, a matrix multiply. Right? So they're basically saying if you've got three embeddings, that's the same as doing three one-hot encodings, putting each through one through a matrix multiply, and then put that through a, a dense layer, or what um, PyTorch would call a linear layer. Right? Um, one of the nice things here is because this is kind of like, well, they thought it was the first paper, it's actually the second, I think, paper to show the idea of using categorical embeddings for um, this kind of data set. They really go to, into quite a lot of detail to, to you know, right back to the, the, the detailed stuff that we learned about. So it's kind of a second, you know, a second cut at thinking about what embeddings are doing. Um, so one of the interesting things that they did was they said, okay, after we've trained a neural net with these embeddings, um, what else could we do with it? So they got uh, a winning result with a neural network with entity embeddings. But then they said, hey, you know what? We could take those entity embeddings and replace each categorical variable with the learned entity embeddings, and then feed that into a GBM. Right? So in other words, like a, rather than passing into the GBM a one-hot encoded version or an ordinal version, let's actually replace the categorical vari variable with its embedding for the appropriate level for that row. Right? So it's actually a way of create, you know, feature engineering. And so um, the mean average percent error without that for GBMs. Um, using just one-hot encodings was 0.15, but with that it was 0.11, right? Random forests without that was 0.16, with that 0.108, nearly as good as the neural net, right? So this is kind of an interesting technique because what it means is in your organization you can train a neural net that has an embedding of stores and an embedding of product types and an embedding of I don't know, whatever kind of high cardinality or even medium cardinality categorical variables you have, and then everybody else in the organization can now like chuck those into their, you know, GBM or random forest or whatever and and use them. And what this is saying is they won't get in fact, you can even use K nearest neighbors with this technique and get nearly as good a result, right? So this is a good way of kind of giving the power of neural nets to everybody in your organization without having them do the fast AI deep learning course first. You know, they can just use whatever SK Learn or R or whatever that they're used to. And like those those embeddings could literally be in a database table, because if you think about it, an embedding is just an index lookup, right? Which is the same as an inner join in SQL, right? So if you've got a table of each product along with its embedding vector, then you can literally do an inner join. And now you have every row in your table along with its product embedding vector. Um, so that's a really this is this is a really useful idea. And GBMs and random forests learn a lot quicker than neural nets do, right? So that's like even if you do know how to train neural nets, this is still potentially quite handy. So here's what happened when they took the various different states of Germany and plotted the first two principal components of their embedding vectors, and they basically, here is where they were in that 2D space, and wackily enough, I've circled in red three cities, and I've circled here the three cities in Germany, and here I've circled in purple, sorry, blue, here are the blue, here's the green, here's the green, so it's actually drawn a map of Germany, even though it never was told anything about how far these states are away from each other, or the very concept of geography didn't exist. Um, so that's pretty crazy. Um, 
So that was from their paper. So I went ahead and uh, looked um, uh, Well, here's another thing. I think this is also from their paper. They took every pair of um, places and they looked at uh, how far away they are on a map versus how far away are they in embedding space and they got this beautiful correlation right so again it, it kind of apparently you know stores that are nearby each other uh, physically have similar characteristics in terms of when people buy more or less stuff from them so I looked at the same thing for days of the week right so here's an embedding of the days of the week uh, from our model and I just kind of joined up Monday Tuesday Wednesday Tuesday Thursday Friday Saturday Sunday I did the same thing for the months of the year right and again you can see you know here's here's winter here's summer uh, so yeah I think like visualizing embeddings can be interesting like it's good to like first of all check you can see things you would expect to see you know uh, and then you could like try and see like Maybe things you didn't expect to see, so you could try all kinds of clusterings or or whatever. Right? Uh, and this is not something which has been widely studied at all, right? So I'm not going to tell you what the limitations are of this technique or um, whatever. Oh uh, yeah, so I've heard of other ways to generate embeddings, like skip grams. Uh huh. I was wondering if you could uh, say, is there one better than the other using neural networks or skip grams? Um, so skip grams is quite specific to NLP, right? So like, um, I'm not sure if we'll cover it in this course, but basically, um, the the approach to original kind of word to vec approach to generating embeddings was to say. Um, you know what we actually don't have We don't actually have um, a Labeled data set, you know, they said all we have is like Google Books and so they have an unsupervised learning problem Unlabeled problem and so the best way in my opinion to turn an unlabeled problem into a labeled problem is to kind of invent some labels and so what they did uh, in the word to vec case was they said okay here's a sentence with 11 words in it Right, and then they said okay, let's delete the middle word And replace it with a random word and so You know originally it said cat and they say no, let's replace that with justice Right so before it said the cute little cat sat on the fuzzy mat and now it says the cute little justice Sat on the fuzzy mat, right? And what they do is they do that so they have one sentence where they keep exactly as is Right and then they make a copy of it and they do the replacement and so then they have a label Where they say it's a one if it was unchanged it was the original and zero otherwise Right, and so basically then you now have something you can build a machine learning model on um, And so they went and built a machine learning model on this so the model was like try and find the the faked sentences um, Not because they were interested in a fake sentence finder But because as a result they now have embeddings that just like we discussed you, you can now use for other purposes and that became word to vec now um, it turns out that if you do this as just a kind of a uh, Effectively like a single matrix multiply rather than make it a deep neural net you can train this super quickly um, um, And so that's basically what they did with they met you know, they kind of decided we're going to make a, a Pretty crappy model like a shallow learning model rather than a deep model um, You know with the downside it's a less powerful model but a number of upsides the first being we can train it on a really large data set and then also really importantly, we're going to end up with embeddings which have really Very linear characteristics so we can like add them together and subtract them and stuff like that, right? Um, so that uh, So there's a lot of stuff we can learn about there from like for, for other types of embedding like categorical embeddings um, specifically if we want categorical embeddings which we can kind of Draw nicely and expect them to us to be able to add and subtract them and behave linearly um, 
you know, probably if we want to use them in k nearest neighbors and stuff, we should probably use shallow learning. Um, if we want something that's going to be more predictive, we probably want to use a neural net. Um, and so actually in NLP, um, uh, I'm really pushing the idea that we need to move past word to vec and glove these linear based methods because it turns out that those embeddings are way less predictive than embeddings learned from deep models. And so the language model that we learned about, which ended up getting a state-of-the-art on sentiment analysis, didn't use GLOVE or word to vec but instead we pre-trained a deep recurrent neural network. Uh, and we ended up with not just a pre-trained word vectors, but a full pre-trained model. So it looks like to create embeddings for entities, we need like a dummy task, right? Not necessarily a dummy task, like in this case we had a real task. Right, so we created the embeddings for Rossman by trying to predict store sales. Um, you only need uh, this isn't just in this isn't just for learning embeddings. For learning any kind of feature space, um, uh, you either need labeled data, or you need to invent some kind of fake task. So. Does a task matter? Like, if I choose a task and train embeddings, if I choose another task and train embeddings, like, which one is? It's a great question, and it's not something that's been studied nearly enough, right? I'm not sure that many people even quite understand that when they say unsupervised learning nowadays, they almost nearly always mean fake task labeled learning. And so the idea of, like, what makes a good fake task? I don't know that I've seen a paper on that, right? But intuitively, you know, we need something where the kinds of relationships it's going to learn are likely to be the kinds of relationships that you probably care about, right? So, for example, in, um, in computer vision, one kind of fake task people use is to say, like, um, Let's take some images and use some kind of like unreal and unreasonable data augmentation, like like recolor them too much or whatever, and then we'll ask the neural net to like predict which one was the augmented and which one was not the augmented. Um, um, yeah, so it's it. I think it's a fascinating area and one which. You know, it would be really interesting for people to, 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 you know, maybe some of the students here to look into further is like take some interesting semi-supervised or unsupervised data sets and try and come up with some like more clever fake tasks and see like does it matter? You know, how much does it matter? Um, in general, like if you can't come up with a fake task that you think seems great, I would say use it, use the best you can. It's often surprising how. How little you need like the ultimately crappy fake task is called the autoencoder right? And the autoencoder um, Is the thing which which won the claims prediction competition that just finished on Kaggle? Uh, they had um, lots of examples of um, Insurance policies where we knew this was how much was claimed and then lots of examples of insurance policies where I, I guess they must have been still Still open. We didn't yet know how much they claimed right and so what they did was they said, okay, so for all of the ones, so let's basically start off by grabbing every policy, right? And we'll take a single policy and we'll put it through a neural net, right? And we'll try and have it reconstruct itself. Um, but in these intermediate layers, and at least one of those intermediate layers, we'll make sure there's less activations than there were inputs. So let's say if there was a hundred variables on the insurance policy, you know, we'll have something in the middle that only has like 20 activations Right and so when you basically are saying hey reconstruct your own input like it's not a different kind of model doesn't require any special code um, It's literally just passing you can use any standard PyTorch or fast AI learner You just say my output equals my input right and that's that's like the the most uncreative, you know, invented task you can create, and that's called an autoencoder, and it works surprisingly well. In fact, to the point that it, it literally just won a Kaggle competition. They took the features that it learnt and chucked it into um, another neural net, and uh, yeah, and won. 
you know, maybe if we have enough um, students taking an interest in this, then um, uh, you know, we'll be able to cover cover unsupervised learning in more detail in in part two, especially given this Kaggle um, recent Kaggle win. Um, I think this may be related to the previous question. Uh, when training language models, um, is a language model, for example, trained on the archive data? Is that useful at all in the movie lens, movie like the movie IMDb data? Great question. You know, I was just talking to Sebastian about this, Sebastian Ruder about this this week, and we thought we'd try and do some research on this in January. Um, it's it's again, it's not well known. We know that in computer vision. It's shockingly effective to train on cats and dogs and use that pre-trained network to do lung cancer diagnosis and CT scans. Um, in the NLP world, nobody much seems to have tried this. The NLP researchers I've spoken to, other than Sebastian, about this assume that it wouldn't work and they generally haven't bothered trying. I, I think it would work great. Uh, so, um, so since we're talking about Rossman, um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll just mention during the week I was interested to see like how how good this solution actually actually was Because um, I noticed that on the public leaderboard. It didn't look like it was going to be that great um, And I also thought it'd be good to see like What does it actually take to use a test set properly with this kind of uh, structured data? So if you have a look at Rossman now I've pushed some changes that actually run the test set through as well and so you can get a sense of how to do this so you'll see basically every line appears twice one for test and uh, one for tr uh, one for train when we get there yeah test train test train test train obviously you could do this in a lot fewer lines of code by putting all of the steps into a method and then pass either the train data set or the test data, data set uh, data frame to it um, in this case I wanted to Kind of for, for teaching purposes, you'd be able to see each step and for, to experiment to see what each step looks like. Um, but you could certainly simplify this code. Um, so yeah, so we do this for every data frame, um, and then for some of these you can see I kind of loop through for data frame in joined and for join test, right? Train and test. Um, this whole thing about the um, Durations, uh, I basically put two lines here one that said data frame equals train columns one that says data frame equals test columns And so my you know basically the idea is you'd run this line first And then you would skip the next one and you'd run everything beneath it And then you'd go back and run this line and then run everything beneath it So some people on the forum were asking how come this code wasn't working this week um, Which is a good reminder that the, the code is not designed to be code that you always Run top to bottom without thinking right you're meant to like think like what is this code here? Should I be running it right now? Okay, um, and so like the early lessons I tried to make it so you can run it top to bottom um, But increasingly as we go along I kind of make it more and more that like you actually have to think about what's going on So Jeremy you're talking about shallow learning and deep learning. Could you define that a bit better? By shallow learning, I think I just mean anything that doesn't have a hidden layer So something that's like a, a, a dot product a, a matrix multiplier basically uh, Okay, so So we end up with a, um, a training and a test version um, and then everything else is basically the same um, One thing to note uh, and a lot of these details of this we cover in the machine learning course by the way Because it's not really deep learning specific. So check that out if you're interested in the details um, uh, I should mention, you know, we use apply cats rather than train cats to make sure that the test set and the training set have the same um, uh, Categorical codes um, that they join to um, we also need to make sure that we keep track of the mapper. This is the thing which basically says what's the mean and standard deviation of each continuous column um, And then apply that same mapper to the test set um, And so when we do all that that's basically it then the rest uh, is easy We just have to pass in the test data frame in the usual way um, when we create our model data object um, and Then there's no changes through all here we train it in the same way and then once we finish training it um, uh, We can then uh, call predict 
um, as per usual passing in true to say this is the test set rather than the validation set and pass that um, off to Kaggle and so it was really interesting because um, This was my submission it got a public score of 103 Which would put us in About 300 and something's place which looks awful right and our private score of 107 Leaderboard private Is about fifth Right so like if you're competing in a Kaggle competition and You don't haven't thoughtfully created a validation set of your own and you're relying on public leaderboard feedback This could totally happen to you, but the other way around you'll be like oh, I'm in the top ten I'm doing great and then uh oh for example at the moment the icebergs competition recognizing icebergs um, a very large percentage of the public leaderboard set is synthetically generated uh, data augmentation data like totally Meaningless and so your validation set is going to be much more helpful than the public leaderboard feedback, right? So um, Yeah, be very careful uh, So our uh, final score here is kind of within statistical noise of the actual third place um, getters So I'm pretty confident that we've We've captured their approach and um, uh, So that's that was uh, pretty interesting um, Something to mention um, There's a nice kernel about the Rossman uh, quite a few nice kernels actually But you can go back and see like particularly if you're doing the groceries competition go and have a look at the Rossman kernels because actually quite a few of them are higher quality than the ones for the Ecuadorian groceries competition um, one of them for example showed how on for particular stores like store 85 um, the sales for non Sundays and the sale for Sundays looked very different um, Whereas there are some other stores where the sales on Sunday don't look any different and you can kind of like get a sense of why you need these kind of interactions The one I particularly wanted to point out is the one I think I briefly mentioned that the third place winners whose um, approach we used they didn't notice is this one and here's a really cool visualization um, here you can see that the store this store is closed Right and just after oh my god, we run out we run out of eggs and just before oh my god Go and get the milk before the the store closes Right and here again Closed bang right so this third place winner actually deleted all of the closed store rows before they started doing any analysis, right? So remember how we talked about like don't touch your data unless you first of all Analyze to see whether that thing you're doing is actually okay No assumptions, right? So in this case, I am sure like I haven't tried it But I'm sure they would have won otherwise right because like although there weren't actually any store closures to my knowledge um, in the test set period the problem is that their model was trying to fit to these like really extreme things And so and because it wasn't able to do it very well It was going to end up getting a little bit confused right? It's not going to break the model, but it's definitely going to harm it because it's kind of trying to do computations to fit something Which it literally doesn't have the data for um, your neck. Can you pass that back there? All right, so um, that uh, Rossman model Again, like it's nice to kind of look inside to see what's actually going on, right? And so that Rossman model I want to make sure you kind of know how to find your way around the code so you can answer these questions for yourself. So it's inside columnar model data now um, We started out by kind of saying hey if you want to look at the code for something you can like go question mark question mark like this and oh, Okay, I need to I haven't got this read in but you can use question mark question mark to um, get the source code for something right um, but obviously like that's not Really a great way because often you look at that source code and it turns out you need to look at something else right and so for those of you that haven't done much coding you might not be aware that almost certainly the Editor you're using probably has the ability to both open up stuff directly off SSH 
and to navigate through it so you can jump straight from place to place. Right? So I want to show you what I mean. So if I want to find columnar model data, and uh, I happen to be using Vim here, I can basically say tag columnar model data, and it will jump straight to the definition of that class. Right? And so then I notice here that like, oh, it's actually building up a data loader. That's interesting. If I hit control right square bracket, it'll jump to the definition of the thing that was under my cursor. And after I finished reading it for a while, I can hit control T to jump back up to where I came from. Right? And you kind of get the idea. Right? Or if I want to find every usage of this in this file um, of columnar model data, um, I can hit star to jump to the next place it's used, you know, and so forth. Right? So in this case, um, get learner was the thing which actually got the model. Um, we want to find out what kind of model it is, and apparently it uses a uh, well, I'm not using collaborative filtering, are we? We're using columnar model data, sorry. Uh, columnar model data, get learner, which uses, and so here you can see mixed input model is the PyTorch model, and then it wraps it in the structured learner, uh, um, which is the uh, The, the fast AI learner type which wraps the data and the model together. So if we want to see the definition of this actual PyTorch model, I can go to control right square bracket to see it, right? And so here is the model, right? Um, and nearly all of this we can now understand, right? So we got past um, We got past a list of embedding sizes. Uh, sure, who's oh, there? It is. In the mixed model uh, that we saw, uh, mm -hmm. does it always expect uh, uh, categorical and uh, continuous together? Yes, it does. And the. Um, The model data behind the scenes, if there are no none of the other type, it creates a, a column of ones or zeros or something. Okay, uh, so if it is null, it can still work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's kind of ugly and, and hacky, and will you know hopefully improve it. But but yeah, you can pass in an empty list of categorical or continuous variables to the model data. And it will basically, yeah, it'll basically pass an unused column of zeros to avoid things breaking. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving fixing some of these slightly hacky edge cases because um, PyTorch 0.4, as well as uh, getting rid of variables, they're going to also add um, rank zero tensors, um, which is to say, if you grab a single thing out of like a rank one tensor rather than getting back a, a number. Which is like qualitatively different. You're actually going to get back a, a tensor that just happens to have no rank. Now it turns out that a lot of this kind of code is going to be much easier to write then. So um, for now, it's it's a little bit more hacky than it needs to be. Um, Jeremy, you talk about this uh, a little bit before, but maybe it's a good time uh, at some point to talk about uh, how can we um, write something that is slightly different for what is on the library. Yeah. I, I think we'll cover that a little bit next week, but I'm mainly going to do that in part two. Like part two is going to cover quite a lot of stuff. Um, one of the main things we'll cover in part two is what are called generative models, so things where the output is a whole sentence or a whole image. Um, but you know, I also dig into like how to really um, uh, either customize the fast AI library or use it on on more custom models. Um, but if we have time, we'll touch on it a little bit next week. Um, okay, so um, the the learner we were passing in um, a list of embedding sizes, and as you can see, that embedding sizes list was literally just the number of rows and the number of columns in each embedding, right? And the number of co rows was just coming from uh, literally how many stores are there in the store uh, category, for example, and the number of columns. Was just equal to that divided by two, 
and a maximum of 50. So that thing, that list of tuples was coming in, and so you can see here how we use it, right? We go through each of those tuples, grab the uh, number of categories and the size of the embedding, and construct an embedding, right? And so that's a that's a list, right? Um, one minor thing, PyTorch specific thing we haven't talked about before is for it to be able to like register. Remember how we kind of said like it registers your parameters, it registers your your layers. Like so, when we like listed the model, it actually printed out the name of each embedding and each bias. Um, it can't do that if they're hidden inside a list, right? They have to be like a they have to be a Uh, an actual nn.module subclass. So there's a special thing called an nn.module list um, Which takes a list and it basically says I want you to register everything in here as being part of this model Okay, so that's just a minor tweak um, So yeah, so our mixed input model has a list of embeddings um, And then I do the same thing for a list of linear layers, right? So when I said Here, 1,500. This is saying how how many activations I wanted for each of my linear layers. Okay, and so here I just go through that list and create a linear layer that goes from this size to the next size. Okay, so you can see like how easy it is to kind of construct your own, not just your own model. But a, a kind of a model which you can pass parameters to have it constructed on the fly dynamically um, batch norm we'll talk about next week um, uh, This is initialization. We've mentioned timing her uh, initialization before and we mentioned it last week um, uh, And then um, Dropout same thing right we have here a list of how much dropout to apply to each layer Right so again here. It's just like go through each thing in that list and create a dropout layer for it Okay, so this constructor we understand everything in it um, except for batch norm, which we don't have to worry about for now um, So that's the constructor and so then the forward um, Also, you know all stuff we're, we're aware of go through each of those embedding layers that we just saw and remember We just treat it like as a function so call it with the ith categorical variable and then concatenate them all together um, put that through dropout Um, and then go through each one of our linear layers and call it Apply ReLU to it Apply dropout to it All right, and then finally apply the final linear layer and the final linear layer has this as its size which is Here right size one there's a single unit sales Okay, so we're kind of getting to the point Where oh, and then of course at the end if this I mentioned we'd, we'd come back to this if you passed in a y underscore range parameter Then we're going to do the thing we just learned about last week Which is to use a sigmoid right and this is a cool little trick to make your not just to make your collaborative filtering better But in this case my basic idea was um, You know sales are going to be greater than zero and probably less than the largest sale they've ever had So I just pass in uh, That as y range and so we do a sigmoid and multiply with the sigmoid by the range that I passed it right and so uh, Hopefully we can find that here Yeah, here it is right so I actually said hey, maybe the range is between zero and You know the highest times 1.2, you know because maybe Maybe the next two weeks we have one bigger right, but this is kind of like again trying to make it a little bit easier for it To give us the kind of results that it thinks is right so like increasingly you know, I'd, I'd love you all to kind of try to Not treat these learners and models as black boxes But to feel like you now have the information you need to look inside them and remember you could then copy and paste this class paste it into a cell in um, Jupyter notebook and uh, start fiddling with it to, to create your own versions Uh, okay I think what I might do is we might take a bit of a early break because we've got a lot to cover and I want to do it all in one big go so let's take a um, uh, Let's take a break until 745 
and then we're going to come back and talk about recurrent neural networks All right um, So we're going to talk about RNNs uh, before we do we're going to um, kind of dig a little bit deeper into SGD Because um, I just want to make sure everybody's totally comfortable with with SGD um, and so what we're going to look at is we're going to look at uh, lesson 6 SGD notebook um, And we're going to look at a really uh, simple example of Using SGD to learn Y equals a x plus B and so what we're going to do here is we're going to create like the simplest possible model uh, Y equals a x plus B okay, and then we're going to generate some random data Uh, that looks like so So here's our X and here's our Y. We want to predict Y from X and We passed in three and eight as our a and B so we're going to kind of try and recover that right? And so the idea is that uh, if we can solve something like this which has two parameters um, we can use the same technique to solve We can use the same technique to solve something with a hundred million parameters Right uh, without any changes at all um, So in order to um, Find a, a and a B that fits this we need a loss function Okay, and this is a regression problem because we have a continuous output uh, So for continuous output regression we tend to use mean squared error right and obviously all of this stuff There's there's implementations in numpy there's implementations in PyTorch. We're just doing stuff by hand so you can see all the steps right so there's MSC Okay, y hat is what we often call our predictions y hat minus y squared mean there's our mean squared error Okay, so for example if we had 10 and 5 were our a and b then there's our mean square error, squared error uh, 3.25 Okay, so if we've got an a and a b and we've got an x and a y then our mean squared error loss is just the mean squared error of our linear That's our predictions and our y. Okay, so there's our loss for 10 5 x y All right, so that's a loss function, right? And so when we um, talk about combining linear layers and loss functions and optionally nonlinear layers, this is all we're doing, right? Is we're putting a function inside a function. Okay, that's that's all. Like I know people draw these clever-looking dots and lines all over the screen when they're saying this is what a neural network is, but it's just a it's just a function of a function of a function. Okay, so here we've got a prediction function being a linear layer followed by a loss function being MSE And now we can say like oh, well, let's just define this as MSE loss and we'll use that in the future Okay, so there's our loss function which incorporates our prediction function All right, so let's generate 10,000 items of fake data um, And let's turn them into variables so we can use them with PyTorch because Jeremy doesn't like taking derivatives So we're going to use PyTorch for that Um, and let's create a random weight for a and for B so a single random number um, And we want the gradients of these to be calculated as we start Computing with them because these are the actual things we need to update in our SGD. Okay, so here's our a and B um, 0.029.111 All right, so let's pick a learning rate Okay, and then let's do 10,000 epochs of SGD uh, In fact, this isn't really SGD. It's not stochastic gradient descent. This is actually full gradient descent. We're going to each um, Each loop is going to look at all of the data Okay um, Stochastic gradient descent would be looking at a subset each time So to do gradient descent we basically calculate the loss right so remember we've started out with a random a and b Okay, and so this is going to compute some amount of loss And then it's nice from time to time. So one way of saying from time to time is if uh, the epoch number mod a thousand is zero Right, so every thousand epochs just print out the loss. See how we're doing. Okay um, So now that we've computed the loss we can compute our gradients Right, and so you just remember this thing here is Both a number a single number that is our loss something we can print But it's also a variable because we passed variables into it and therefore it also has a method dot backward Which means calculate the gradients 
of everything that we asked it to, everything where we said requires grad equals true. Okay, so at this point we now have um, a dot grad property inside A and inside B, and here they are. Here is that dot grad, dot grad property. Okay, so now that we've calculated the gradients for A and B, we can update them by saying A is equal to whatever it used to be minus the learning rate times the gradient. Right? Uh, dot data, because A is a variable, and a variable contains a tensor in its dot data property, and we, again, this is going to disappear in PyTorch 0.4, but for now it's actually the tensor that we need to update. Okay? So update the tensor inside here with whatever it used to be, minus the learning rate times the gradient. Okay, and that's basically it, right? That's basically all gradient descent is. Okay, so it's it's as simple as we claimed. Um, there's one extra step in PyTorch, which is that you might have like multiple different loss functions or like lots of lots of output layers um, all contributing to the gradient, and you like have to add them all together. And so, if you've got multiple loss functions, you could be calling loss dot backward on each of them, and what it does is it adds it to the gradients, right? And so you have to tell it when to set the gradients back to zero. Okay, so that's where you just go. Okay, set a to zero, and uh, gradients, and set b gradients to zero. Okay, and so this is wrapped up inside the uh, you know optim dot sgd class. Right, so when we say optim dot sgd and we just say you know dot step, it's just doing these for us. So when we say dot zero gradients, it's just doing this for us. Um, and this underscore here. Um, every um, pretty much every function that applies to a tensor in PyTorch, uh, if you stick an underscore on the end, it means do it in place. Okay, so this is actually going to not return a bunch of zeros, but it's going to change this in place to be a bunch of zeros. Um, so that's basically it. Um, we can look at the same thing without PyTorch, um, uh, which means we actually do have to do some calculus. So if we generate some fake data again, um, we're just going to create 50 data points this time just to make this fast and easy to look at. Um, and so let's create a function called update, right? We're just going to use NumPy, no PyTorch. Okay, so our predictions is equal to, again, linear. Um, and in this case, we're actually going to calculate the derivatives. So the derivative of the square of the loss is just two times. Uh, and then the derivative with respect to a is just that uh, you can confirm that yourself if you want to and so here our We're going to update a minus equals learning rate times the derivative of uh, uh, loss with respect to a and for B it's learning rate times derivative with respect to B okay, and so what we can do um, Let's just run all this um, So just for fun rather than looping through manually we can use the matplot matplotlib func animation command um, to run uh, the animate function a bunch of times, and the animate function is going to run 30 epochs, and at the end of each epoch it's going to print out uh, on the plot where the line currently is, and that creates this little movie. Okay, So you can actually see the, the, the line moving into place. Right? So if you want to play around with like understanding how PyTorch gradients actually work step by step. Here's like the world's simplest little example. Okay, um, and you know it's kind of like it's kind of weird to say like that's that's it. Like when you're optimizing a hundred million parameters in a neural net, it's doing the same thing. But it it actually is right. You can actually look at the PyTorch code and see it's this is it. Right? There's no trick. Um, uh, we, well, we learned a couple of minor tricks um, last time, which was like momentum and atom, right? But if you can do it in Excel, you can do it in Python. So, okay. So let's now talk about um, RNNs. So we're now in lesson six RNN notebook. Um, and we're going to study Nietzsche, uh, as you should. Um, so Nietzsche says, supposing that truth is a woman, what then? I love this. Uh, 
apparently all philosophers have failed to understand women so apparently at the point that Nietzsche was alive there was no female philosophers uh, or at least those that were around didn't understand women either so anyway so this is the philosopher apparently we've chosen to study it, Nietzsche is actually much less worse than people think he is um, but it's a different era I guess uh, all right so we're going to learn uh, to write um, philosophy uh, like Nietzsche um, and so we're going to do it um, one character at a time So this is like the language model that we did in lesson four where we did it a word at a time But this time we're going to do it a character at a time And so the main thing I'm going to try and convince you is an RNN is no different to anything you've already learned Okay, and so to show you that we're going to build it um, from plain PyTorch layers all of which are extremely familiar already Okay, and eventually we're going to use something really complex, which is a for loop Okay, so that's when we're going to make it really sophisticated So um, the basic idea of RNNs is that you want to keep track of um, The main thing is you want to keep track of kind of state over long-term dependencies So for example, if you're trying to model something like this kind of um, uh, Template language right then at the end of your percent comment do percent you need a percent comment end percent right and so somehow your model needs to keep track of the fact that it's like inside a comment uh, Over all of these different characters right and so this is this idea of state it needs kind of memory right and this is quite a difficult uh, Thing to do with like just a conf conf net. It, it turns out actually to be possible, but um, uh, It's it's you know a little bit tricky um, Where else with an RNN uh, it turns out to be um, pretty straightforward Right, so these are the basic ideas if you want a stateful representation where you're kind of keeping track of like where are we now have memory have long-term dependencies and Potentially even have variable length Sequences uh, these are all difficult things to do with confidence um, They're very straightforward with RNNs. So for example um, Swift key uh, a year or so ago did a blog post about how they had a new language model where they basically this is from their blog post where they basically said like of course, this is what their neural net looks like <laughs> uh, Somehow they always look like this uh, on the internet um, You know you've got a bunch of words and it's basically going to take your particular words in their particular orders and try and figure out What the next words going to be which is to say they they built a language model They actually have a pretty good language model if you've used Swift key uh, They seem to do better predictions than anybody else still um, another cool example was Andre Kapathy a couple of years ago showed that he could use character level RNN to actually create an entire LaTeX document so he didn't actually tell it in any way what LaTeX looks like he just passed in some LaTeX text like this and said generate more LaTeX text and it literally started writing something which means about as much to me as most math papers do so <laughs> um, Okay so we're going to start with something that's not an RNN, and I'm going to introduce um, Jeremy's patented uh, neural network notation involving boxes, circles, and triangles. Um, um, so let me explain what's going on. Um, a, a rectangle is an input. An arrow is a layer. A, a circle. Uh, in fact, every square is a bunch of activate. Sorry, every shape is a bunch of activations. Right? The rectangle is the input activations. A circle is a hidden activations, and a triangle is an output activations. An arrow is a, a layer operation, right? Or possibly more than one. Right? So here, my rectangle is an input of number of rows equal to batch size. And number of columns equal to the number of number of inputs number of variables right and so my first arrow my first uh, operation is going to represent a matrix product followed by a ReLU and that's going to generate a set of activations remember activations an activation is a number right? an activation is a number a number that's being calculated by a ReLU or a matrix product or whatever it's a number right so this circle here represents a matrix of activations all of the numbers that come out when we take the inputs 
we do a matrix product followed by a ReLU. So we started with batch size byte number of imports, and so after we do this matrix operation, we now have batch size by you know whatever the number of columns in our um, matrix product was by number of hidden units. Okay, and so if we now take these activations, right, which is the matrix, and we put it through another operation, in this case another matrix product and a softmax, we get a triangle, that's our output activations, another matrix of activations, and again, number of rows is batch size, number of columns number is equal to the number of classes, again, however many columns our matrix in this matrix product had. So that's a um, uh, that's a neural net, right? That's our basic kind of one hidden layer neural net. And if you haven't written one of these from scratch, try it. You know, um, and in fact, in lessons nine, ten, and eleven of the machine learning course, we do this, right? We we create one of these from scratch. So if you're not quite sure how to do it, you can check out the machine learning course. Now, in general, the machine learning course is much more like building stuff up from the foundations, whereas this course is much more like best practices, kind of top down. Uh, all right. So if we were doing like a convnet with a single dense hidden layer. Our input would be equal to um, actually number, uh, yeah, sorry, in PyTorch, number of channels by height by width, right? And notice that here batch size appeared every time, so I'm not going to I'm not going to write it anymore. Okay, so I've removed the batch size. Also, the activation function, it's always basically ReLU or something similar for all the hidden layers and softmax at the end for classification. So I'm not going to write that either. Okay, so I'm kind of each picture. I'm going to simplify it a little bit All right, so I'm not going to mention batch size. It's still there We're not going to mention ReLU or softmax, but it's still there. So here's our input and so in this case rather than a um, Matrix product we'll do a convolution a stride to convolution So we'll skip over every second one or could be a convolution followed by a max pool uh, in either case we end up with something which is uh, replaced number of channels with number of filters Right, and we have now height divided by two and width divided by two. Okay, and then We can flatten that out somehow. We'll talk next week about the main way we do that nowadays Which is basically to do something called an adaptive max pooling uh, Where we're basically going to average uh, across the height and the width um, And turn that into a vector anyway somehow we flatten it out into a vector we can do a matrix product Um, or a couple of matrix products we actually tend to do in fast AI um, So that'll be our fully connected layer with some number of activations the Final matrix product gives us some number of classes. Okay, so this is our basic component remembering Rectangle is input circle is hidden Triangle is output all of the shapes represent a tensor of activations all of the arrows represent a operation a layer operation All right, so now let's going to jump to the one the first one that we're going to actually um, try to uh, Try to create for NLP and we're going to basically do exactly the same thing as here right um, And we're going to try and predict the third character in a three character sequence based on the previous two characters so our input and again remember we've removed The batch size dimension, but we're not saying it, but it's still here. Okay, um, and also here I've removed the names of the layer operations entirely. Okay, just keeping simplifying things. So, for example, our first input would be the first character of each uh, string in our mini batch. Okay, and um, assuming this is one hot encoded. Then the the width is just however many items there are in the vocabulary. How many unique characters could we have? Okay, um, we probably won't really one hot encode it We'll feed it in as an integer and pretend it's one hot encoded by using an embedding layer, which is mathematically identical Okay, and then we um, that's going to give us some activations which we can stick through a fully connected layer Okay um, uh, So we we put that through a fully connect, uh, through a fully connected layer to get some activations We can then put that through another fully connected layer and now we're going to bring in The input of character two right so the character two input will be exactly the same dimensionality as the character one input 
and we now need to somehow combine these two arrows together. So we could just add them up, for instance, right? Because remember, this arrow here represents a matrix product, so this matrix product is going to spit out the same dimensionality as this matrix product. So we could just add them up to create these activations. And so now we can put that through another matrix product, and of course remember all these matrix products have a ReLU as well, um, and this final one will have a softmax instead to create our predicted set of characters. Right? So it's a standard, uh, you know, two hidden layer, uh, I guess it's actually three matrix products, uh, neural net. Um, this first one is coming through an embedding layer. Uh, the only difference is that we're also got a second input coming in here that we're just adding in, right? But it's kind of conceptually identical. Um, so let's let's implement that um, uh, for Nietzsche, right? So and I'm not going to use torch text. Uh, I'm going to try not to use almost any fast AI, so we can see it all kind of again from raw. Right, so here's the first 400 characters of the collected works. Um, let's grab a set of all of the letters that we see there um, and sort them. Okay, and so a set creates all the unique letters. So we've got 85 unique letters in our vocab. Um, let's pop a. It's nice to put an empty kind of a null or some some kind of padding character in there for padding. So we're going to put a padding character at the start. Right, and so here is. Um, what our vocab looks like. Okay, so so cars is our vocab. Uh, so as per usual, we want some way to map uh, every character to a unique ID and every unique ID to a character. Um, and so now we can just go through our collected works of Nietzsche and grab the index of each one of those characters. So now we've just turned it into this. Right, so rather than quote P R E, we now have 40, 42, 29. Okay, so um, so that's basically the first step. And just to confirm, we can now take each of those indexes and turn them back into characters and join them together. And yeah, there it is. Okay, so um, from now on, we're just going to work with this IDX list, the list of character numbers in the connected works of Nietzsche. Yes? So, Jeremy, why are we doing like a model of characters and not a model of words? I just thought it seemed simpler, you know, with a vocab of 80-ish items we can kind of see it better. Um, character level models turn out to be potentially quite useful in a number of situations, but we'll cover that in part two. Uh, the short answer is like, you generally want to combine both a word level model and a character level model, like if you're doing, say, translation. Um, it's a great way to deal with unknown, like unusual words, rather than treating it as unknown. Anytime you see a word you haven't seen before, you could use a character level model for that. Um, and there's actually something in between the two called a byte pair encoding, BPE, which basically looks at little n-grams of characters, um, but we'll cover all that in part two. Uh, if you want to look at it right now, um, then uh, part two of the existing course already has this stuff um, taught. And part two of the version one of this course, uh, all, the, all the NLP stuff is in PyTorch, by the way, so you'll understand it straight away. Um, it was actually the thing that inspired us to move to PyTorch, because trying to do it in Keras turned out to be a nightmare. All right, so let's create the inputs to this. Um, we're actually going to do something slightly different than what I said. We're actually going to um, try and predict the fourth character, uh, the well, actually the, the fifth character using the first four. So the index four character using the index zero, one, two, and three. Right? So we're going to do exactly the same thing, but with just a couple more layers. So that means that we need a list of um, the zeroth, first, second, and third characters. That's so I'm just getting every character from the start, from the one, from two, from three, skipping over three at a time. Uh, okay, so hmm, this is ah I I said this wrong. So we're going to predict the third character 
the fourth character from the third from the first three. Okay, the fourth character from the first three. Um, all right, so our inputs will be these three lists, right? So we can just use np.stack to pop them together, right? So here's the 0, 1, and 2 characters that are going to feed into our model, and then here is the next character in the list. So for example, um, x1, x2, x3, and y. All right. So you can see, for example, we start off the first, uh, the very first item would be 40, 42, and 29. Right? So that's characters 0, 1, and 2. And then we'd be predicting 30. That's the fourth character, which is the start of the next row. Right? So then 30, 25, 27. We need to predict 29. Which is the start of the next row, and so forth. So we're always using three characters to predict the fourth. Um, so there are 200,000 of these um, that we're going to try and model. Right. So we're going to build this model, which means we need to decide how many activations. Uh, so I'm going to use 256. Okay. And we need to decide how big our embeddings are going to be. And so I decided to use 42, so about half the number of characters I have. Um, and you can play around with these to see if you can come up with better numbers. It's just kind of experimental. Um, and now we're going to build our model. Now I'm going to change my model slightly. And so here is the, the full version. So predicting character 4 using characters 1, 2, and 3. As you can see, it's the same picture as the previous page. But I put some very important colored arrows here. All the arrows of the same color are going to use the same matrix, the same weight matrix, right? So all of our input embeddings are going to use the same matrix. All of our um, layers that go from one layer to the next are going to use the same orange arrow weight matrix, and then our output will have its own matrix. So we're going to have one, two, three weight matrices. Right? And the idea here is the reason I'm not going to have a separate one for every everything here is that like Why would kind of semantically a character have a different meaning depending if it was the first or the second or the third item in a sequence Like it's not like we're even starting every sequence at the start of a sentence We just arbitrarily chopped it into groups of three right so you would expect these to all have the same kind of conceptual mapping and ditto like when we're moving from character naught to character one you know to kind of say build up some state here. Why would that be any different kind of operation to moving from character one to character two? Right? So that's the basic idea. So let's create a three character model and So we're going to create one linear layer for our green arrow One linear layer for our orange arrow and one linear layer for our blue arrow and then also one embedding Okay so the embedding is going to bring in something with of size, whatever it was, 84, I think, vocab size, and spit out something with a number of factors in the embedding. Um, we'll then put that through a linear layer, um, and then we've got our hidden layers, we've got our output layer. So when we call forward, we're going to be passing in one, two, three characters. So for each one, we'll stick it through an embedding, we'll stick it through a linear layer, and we'll stick it through a ReLU. Okay, so we'll do it for character 1, character 2, and character 3. Okay. Then, I'm going to create this circle of activations here. Okay, and that matrix I'm going to call H. Right, and so it's going to be equal to my input activations. Okay, after going through the ReLU and the linear layer and the embedding, right? And then I'm going to apply this uh, L hidden, so the orange arrow, and that's going to get me to here. Okay, so that's what this layer here does. And then to get to the next one, I need to apply the same thing. Okay, I need to apply the orange arrow to that. 
okay, but I also have to add in this second input right so take my second input and add in Okay, my previous layer Yannette, uh, could you pass that back through us? I don't really see how these dimensions are the same from H and I and 2 from which to which from uh, uh, yeah okay let's go through it so let's figure out the dimensions together so self dot e is going to be of length 42 okay and then it's going to go through l in I'm just going to make it of size n hidden okay um, and so then we're going to pass that which is now a size n hidden through this which is also going to return something of size n hidden. Okay, so it's really important to notice that this is square. This is a square weight matrix. Okay, so we now know that this is of size n hidden. n2 is going to be exactly the same size as n1 was, which is n hidden. So we can now sum together two uh, sets of activations, both of size n hidden, passing it into here, and again it returns something of size n hidden. So basically the trick was to make this a square matrix and to make sure that its square matrix was the same size as the output of this hidden layer. Thanks for the great question. Can you pass that back to your net? Jeremy, is uh, summing the only thing people can do in these cases? No, but we'll come back to that in a moment. That's a great point. Okay. Um, I don't like it when I have like three bits of code that look identical and then three bits of code that look nearly identical but aren't quite because it's harder to refactor. So I'm going to put a uh, make H into a bunch of zeros so that I can then put H here and these are now identical. Right? So that the, the hugely complex trick that we're going to do uh, very shortly is to replace these three things with a for loop. Okay? And it's going to loop through one, two, and three. Right? That's that's going to be the for loop. Well, actually, zero, one, and two. Okay. At that point, we'll be able to call it a recurrent neural network. Okay. So just to skip ahead a little bit. All right. So we create that um, that model. Let's make sure I've run all these so we can actually run this thing. Okay. Um, so uh, we can now just use the same columnar model data class that we've used before. And if we use from arrays, um, then it's basically just going to spit back the exact arrays we gave it, right? So if we pass, if we stack together those three arrays, then it's going to feed us those three things back to our forward method. So if you want to like play around with training models using like you know as raw an approach as possible, but without writing lots of boilerplate, this is kind of how to do it. Use columnar model data from arrays. And then if you pass in whatever you pass in here, right, you're going to get back here. Okay? Um, so I've passed in three things, which means I'm going to get sent three things. Okay, so that's how that works. Um, batch size 512, because this is, you know, this data is tiny, so I can use a bigger batch size. Um, so I'm not using really much fast AI stuff at all. I'm using fast AI stuff just to save me fiddling around with data loaders and data sets and stuff, but I'm actually going to create a standard PyTorch model. I'm not going to create a learner. Okay, so this is a standard PyTorch model, and because I'm using PyTorch, that means I have to remember to write .cuda. Okay, let's stick it on the GPU. So, Here is how we can look inside at what's going on, right? So we can say iter md.train data loader to grab the iterator to iterate through the training set. Uh, we can then call next on that to grab a mini batch, and that's going to return uh, all of our x's and our y tensor. And so we can then take a look at, you know, here's our x's, for example. Right? And so you would expect. Have a think about what you would expect for this length. Three, not surprisingly, because these are the three things. Okay, and so then excess zero, not surprisingly, okay, is of length 512. Um, 
and it's not actually one hot encoded because we use an embedding to pretend it is Okay, and so then we can use a model as if it's a function Okay by passing to it the variableized version of our tensors and So have a think about what you would expect to be returned here Okay, so not surprisingly we had a mini batch of 512 so we still have 512 and then 85 is the probability of each of the possible vocab items and of course we've got the log of them because that's kind of what we do in PyTorch. Okay, you can see here the softmax. All right. So that's how you can look inside, right? So you can see here how to do everything really very much by hand. Uh, so we can create an optimizer uh, again using standard PyTorch. So with PyTorch, uh, when you use a PyTorch optimizer, you have to pass in a list of the things to optimize. And so if you call m.parameters, that will return that list for you. Uh, and then we can fit. And there it goes. Okay. Um, and so we don't have learning rate finders and SGDR and all that stuff because we're not using a learner, so we'll have to manually do learning rate annealing. So set the learning rate a little bit lower and fit again. Okay. And so now we can write a little function to to test this thing out. Okay, so um, Here's something called get next um, Where we can pass in three characters Like y full stop space right and so I can then go through and turn that into a tensor with capital T uh, of an array of the character index for each character in that list. So basically turn those into the integers Turn those into variables pass that to our model Right, and then we can do an argmax on that to grab which character number is it uh, and in order to do stuff in numpy land I, I use 2np to turn that variable into a numpy array right and then I can return that character and so for example a capital T was what it thinks would be reasonable after seeing y full stop space That seems like a very reasonable way to start a sentence If it was PPL E that sounds reasonable space th e that sounds reasonable a and d space that sounds reasonable so it seems to have like created something sensible right so you know the important thing to note here is our character model is a totally standard fully connected model right the only slightly interesting thing we did was to kind of do this addition of of each of the inputs one at a time Okay um, But there's nothing new conceptually here. We're training it in, this, in the usual way All right Let's now create an RNN So an RNN is when we do Um, exactly the same thing That we did here Right, but I could draw this more simply by saying you know what if we've got a green arrow going to a circle Let's not draw a green arrow going to a circle again and again and again But let's just draw it like this green arrow going to a circle right and rather than drawing an orange arrow going to a circle Let's just draw it like this Okay, so this is the same picture exactly the same picture As this one Right um, and so you just have to say how many times to go around this circle right so in this case if we want to predict character number n from characters 1 through n minus 1 Then we can take the character 1 input get some activations feed that to some new activations that go through remember orange is the hidden to hidden weight matrix Right and each time we'll also bring in the next character of input through its embeddings Right so that picture and that picture are two ways of writing the same thing um, But this one is more flexible because rather than me having to say hey, let's do it for eight I don't have to draw eight circles Right. I can just say oh just repeat this um, So I could simplify this a little bit further by saying you know what rather than having this thing as a special case Let's actually start out with a bunch of zeros right and then let's have all of our characters Inside here. Yes. Jeremy, 
Oh, okay. so yeah. So um, I was wondering if you can explain a little bit better why are you reusing those? Um, why use the same colored arrows? The same. Yeah. What are you? You kind of seem to be reusing the same same weight matrices. Weight matrices. Um, yeah. Maybe this is kind of similar to what we did in convolutional neural nets, like. Is somehow no, I don't think so. At least not that I can see. So the idea is just kind of semantically speaking, like this arrow here. This this arrow here is saying take a character of import and represent it as some so some set of features. Right, and this arrow is saying the same thing. Take some character and represent as a set of features, and so is this one. Right, so like, why would the three be represented with different weight matrices? Because it's all doing the same thing. Right, and this orange arrow is saying, um, kind of transition from character zero's state to character one state to character two's state. Again, it's it's the same thing. It's like why would the transition from character zero to one be different to character from transition from one to two? So the idea is like, but is to like say, hey, if if it's doing the same conceptual thing, let's use the exact same weight matrix. Yeah, my comment on convolution neural networks is that a filter also is applied. Oh, to multiple Several. places. Multiple yeah, that's places. an interesting point of view. It's, yeah, it's like I see. So you're saying like a convolution is almost like a kind of a special dot product with shared weights. Yeah, no, that's okay. Uh, that's a very good point. And in fact, one of our students actually wrote a good blog post about that last year. We should dig that up. Okay, I totally see where you're coming from, and I totally agree with you. Um, all right, so let's um, let's implement this version. So this time we're going to do eight characters, eight C's, okay? and so let's create a list of uh, every eighth character um, from zero through seven, and then our outputs will be the next character, and so we can stack that together, and so now we've got 600,000 by eight. Um, so here's an example. So for example, after this series of eight characters, right? So this is characters naught through eight. This is characters one through nine. This is two through ten. Right? These are all overlapping. Okay. So after characters one naught through eight, this is going to be the next one. Okay. And then after these characters, this will be the next one. Right. So you can see that this one here has forty-three as its y value. Right. Because after those the next one will be 43 okay so so this is the first eight characters this is two through nine three through ten and so forth right so these are overlapping groups of eight characters and then this is the the next one along okay um, so let's create that model okay so again we use from arrays to Create a model data class, and so you'll see here we have exactly the same code as we had before. There's our embedding, linear, hidden output. These are literally identical, okay? And then we've replaced our ReLU of the linear input of the embedding with something that's inside a loop, okay? And then we've replaced the self.l hidden thing, okay? Also inside the loop. Um, I just realized I didn't mention last time the use of the hyperbolic tan. Um, hyperbolic tan looks like this. Okay, so it's just a sigmoid that's offset, right? And it's very common to use a hyperbolic tan inside this trend this state to state transition because it kind of stops it from flying off too high or too low. You know, it's nicely controlled. Uh, back in the old days, we used to use hyperbolic tan or the equivalent sigmoid a lot as most of our activation functions. Nowadays we tend to use ReLU, but in these uh, hidden state to hidden state uh, uh, transition weight matrices, we still tend to use hyperbolic tan quite a lot. 
So you'll see I've done that also here, hyperbolic tab. Okay, so this is exactly the same as before, but I've just replaced it with a for loop. And then here's my output. Yes, you know. So uh, does it have to do anything with convergence of these networks? Uh, yeah, kind of. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit over time. Um, let's 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 come back to that though. Um, for now, we're not really going to do anything special at all. Um, you know, recognizing this is just a standard fully connected network. Um, you know, interestingly, it's quite a deep one, right? Like because this is actually this, but we've got eight of these things now. We've now got a, a, a deep eight-layer network, which is why Yannette's starting to suggest we should be concerned. Is you know, as we get deeper and deeper networks, they can be harder and harder to train. Uh, but let's try training this. All right, so away it goes. Um, as before, we've got a batch size of 512. Um, we're using Atom. Um, and away it goes. So we won't sit there watching it. So we can then set the learning rate down back to 1 in egg 3. Uh, we can fit it again. Um, and yeah, it's actually, it, it seems to be training fine. Okay. Um, but we're going to try something else, which is we're going to use the trick that uh, Yannette rather hinted at before, which is maybe we shouldn't be adding these things together. And so the reason you might want to be feeling a little uncomfortable about adding these things together is that the input state and the hidden state are kind of qualitatively different kinds of things, right? The input state is the, is the encoding of this character, whereas H represents the encoding of the series of characters so far, and so adding them together is kind of potentially going to lose information. So I think what Yannette was going to prefer that we might do is maybe to concatenate these instead of adding them. Does that sound good to you, Yannette? Yeah, she's nodding. Okay, so let's now uh, make a copy of the previous cell, all the same, right? But rather than using plus, let's use cat. Right? Now if we can cat, then we need to make sure now that our input layer is not from n fac to hidden, which is what we had before, but because we're concatenating, it needs to be n fac plus n hidden to n hidden. Okay, and so now that's going to make all the dimensions work nicely. So this now is of size n fac plus n hidden. This now makes it back to size n hidden again. Okay, and then this is putting it through the same square matrix as before, so it's still of size n hidden. Okay, so this is like a good design heuristic if you're designing an architecture is if you've got different types of information that you want to combine, you generally want to concatenate it. Right? You, you know, adding things together, even if they're the same shape, is losing information. Okay, and so once you've concatenated things together, you can always convert it back down to a fixed size by just chucking it through a matrix product. Okay, so that's all we've done here. Again, it's the same thing, but now we're concatenating instead. And so we can fit that. And so last time we got 1.72, this time we got 1.68. So it's not setting the world on fire, but it's an improvement. And the improvements are good. Okay, so we can now test that with the get next. And so now we can pass in eight things. All right, so it's now going to be for those. It looks good, or part of. That sounds good as well. So queens, and uh, that sounds good too. All right. So great. So that's enough um, manual hackery. Um, let's see if PyTorch can do some of this for us. And so basically, what PyTorch will do for us is it will write this loop automatically. Okay, and it will create these linear input layers automatically. Okay, and so to ask it to do that, we can use the nn.rnn plus. So here's the exact same thing uh, in less code by taking advantage of PyTorch. And again, I'm not using a conceptual analogy to say PyTorch is doing something like it. I'm saying PyTorch is doing it. Right? This is just the code you just saw 
wrapped up a little bit, refactored a little bit for your convenience, right? So where we say we now want to create an R at N, uh, called R at N, then what this does is it does that for loop. Now notice that our for loop needed a starting point. You remember why, right? Because otherwise our for loop didn't quite work, we couldn't quite refactor it out. And because this is exactly the same, this needs a starting point too. Right? So let's give it a starting point, and so you have to pass in your initial hidden state. Okay? For reasons that will become apparent later on, um, it turns out uh, to be quite useful to be able to get back that hidden state at the end. Uh, and just like we could here, we could actually keep track of the hidden state. Um, we get back two things. We get back both the output and the hidden state. Right? So we pass in the input and the hidden state, and we get back the output and the hidden state. Yes. Um, could you remind us what the hidden state represents? There? The hidden state is H. So it's the um, it's the orange circle ellipse mm -hmm. of activations. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so it is of size two fifty six. Okay. Um, all right, so we can Okay, there's one other thing to, to know which is in our case We were replacing H with a new hidden state um, The one minor difference in PyTorch is they append the new hidden state to a list or to a tensor Which gets bigger and bigger so they actually give you back all of the hidden states So in other words, rather than just giving you back the final ellipse, they give you back all the ellipses stacked on top of each other. And so because we just want the final one, I just got indexed into it with minus one here. Okay. Other than that, this is the same code as before. Put that through our output layer to get the correct vocab size, and then we can train that. Um, Right, so you can see here I can do it manually, I can create some hidden state, I can pass it to that R and N, I can see the stuff I get back. Um, you'll see that the um, dimensionality of H, it's actually a rank 3 tensor, where else in my version it was a um, let's see where it, it was a rank 2 tensor. Okay? And the difference is here we've got just a unit axis at the front. Um, We'll learn more about why that is later, um, but basically it turns out you can have a, a second R and N that goes backwards, right? One that goes forwards, one that goes backwards, and the idea is it can then it's going to be better at finding relationships that kind of go backwards. That's called a bidirectional R and N. Also, it turns out you can have an R and N feed to an R and N. That's called a multi-layer R and N. So basically, um, if you have those things, you need uh, an additional axis on your tensor to keep track of those. Additional layers of hidden state, um, but for now we'll always have a one here um, And we'll always also get back a one at the end Okay um, So if we go ahead and fit this now um, Let's actually train it for a bit longer Okay, uh, so last time we only kind of did a couple of epochs um, this time we'll do four epochs uh, What did we set uh, at one in egg three? And then we'll do another two epochs at one in egg four. Uh, and so we've now got our loss down to 1.5. Um, so getting better and better. Um, so here's our get next again. Okay. And you know, let's just it was the same thing. Um, so what we can now do is we can loop through like 40 times calling get next each time. And then each time we'll replace our input by removing the first character and adding the thing that we just predicted And so that way we can like feed in a new set of eight characters again and again and again uh, And so that way we'll call that get next n. So here are 40 characters that we've generated so we started out with four THOS We got four those of the same to the same to the same You can probably guess what happens if you keep predicting the same to the same All right, so it's you know, it's doing okay um, We we now have something which you know um, 
we've basically built from scratch and then we've said here's how PyTorch refactored it for us. So if you want to like have an interesting little homework assignment this week, try to write your own version of an RNN class. Right? Like try to like literally like create your like you know Jeremy's RNN and then like type in here Jeremy's RNN or in your case maybe your name's not Jeremy, which is okay too. Um, and then get it to run writing your implementation of that class from scratch without looking at the PyTorch source code. Um, you know, like basically it's just a case of like going up and seeing what we did back here, right? And like make sure you get the same answers uh, and confirm that you do. So that's kind of a good little test. Uh, sim very simple little assignment, uh, but I think you'll feel really good when you've seen like, oh, I've just re-implemented nn.rnn. Alright, so I'm going to do one other thing. When I switched from this one, when I've moved the car one input inside the dotted line, right? This dotted rectangle represents the thing I'm repeating. I also watch the triangle, the output. I move that inside as well. Now that's a big difference because now what I've actually done is I'm actually saying spit out an output after every one of these circles. So spit out an output here and here and here. Right? So in other words, if I have a three character input, I'm going to spit out a three character output. I'm saying after character one, this will be next. After character two, this will be next. After character three, this will be next. So again, nothing different. And again, this, you know, if you wanted to go a bit further with the assignment, you could write this by hand as well. Um, but basically what we're saying is in the for loop, we'd be saying like, you know, um, results equals some empty list, right? And then we'd be going through and rather than returning that, we'd instead be saying, you know, um, results.append that, right? And then like return whatever, torch.stat. Something like that, right? That may even be right, I'm not quite sure. Um, so now, you know, we now have like every step we've created an output, okay? So which is basically this picture. And so the reason, well there's lots of reasons that's interesting, um, but I think the main reason right now that's interesting is that you probably noticed this This approach to dealing with our data seems terribly inefficient. Like we're grabbing the first eight, right? But then this next set, all but one of them overlap the previous one, right? So we're kind of like recalculating the exact same embeddings. Seven out of eight of them are going to be exact same embeddings, right? Exact same transitions. Uh, it kind of seems weird to like do all this calculation to just predict one thing and then go back and recalculate seven out of eight of them and add one more to the end to calculate the next thing, right? So the basic idea then is to say, well, let's not do it that way. Instead, let's take non-overlapping sets of characters, right? So, like so, here is our first eight characters. Here is the next eight characters. Here are the next eight characters. So like if you read this top left to bottom right, that would be the whole Nietzsche. Right? And so then, if these are the first eight characters, then offset this by one, starting here, that's a list of outputs. Right? So after we see characters zero through seven, we should predict characters one through eight. That makes sense. So after 40 should come 42, as it did. After 42 should come 29, as it did. Right? And so now that can be our inputs and labels for that model. And so it shouldn't be any more or less accurate. It should just be the same, right? Pretty much. Um, but it should allow us to do it more efficiently. So let's try that.
All right. So I mentioned last time that we had a minus one index here because we just wanted to grab the last triangle. Okay. So in this case, we're going to grab all the triangles. So this this is actually the way an n.rnn creates things. Um, we we only kept the last one, but this time we're going to keep all of them. So we've made one change, which is to remove that minus one. Uh, other than that, this is the exact same code as before. Okay. So, um, well, there's nothing much to show you here. I mean, uh, except of course, um, if this time if we look at the uh, the labels, it's now five twelve by eight, right? Because we're trying to predict eight things every time. So there is one complexity here, which is that we want to use the negative log likelihood uh, loss function um, as before, right? But the negative loss likelihood lo uh, loss function, just like our MSE, expects to receive two rank one tensors. Well, actually, with the mini batch axis, two rank two tensors, right? So two two mini batches of vectors. Um, problem is that we've got uh, eight uh, time steps, you know, eight characters. In an RNN, we call it a, a time step. Right? We have eight time steps, uh, and then for each one, we have 84 probabilities. We have the probability for uh, every single um, one of those eight time steps, and then we have that for each of our 512 items in the mini batch. So we have a rank three tensor, not a rank two tensor. Um, so that means that the negative log likelihood loss function is going to spit out an error. Um, and frankly, I think this is kind of dumb. You know, I think it would be better if uh, PyTorch had written their loss functions in such a way that they didn't care at all about rank and they just applied it to whatever rank you gave it. But for now, at least, it, it does care about rank. But the nice thing is I get to show you how to write a custom loss function. Okay, so we're going to create a special negative log likelihood loss function for sequences. Okay, and so it's going to take an input and a target, and it's going to call f dot negative log likelihood loss. So the PyTorch one. Okay. Um, but what we're going to do is we're going to flatten our input, and we're going to flatten our targets. Right, and so, and it turns out these are going to be um, uh, the first two axes are going to have to be transposed. So the way um, PyTorch handles RNN data by default is the first axis is the sequence length. In this case, eight. Right. So the sequence length of an RNN is how many time steps. So we have eight characters. So a sequence length of eight. The second axis is the batch size, and then, as you would expect, the third axis is the actual hidden state itself. Okay, so this is going to be eight by five twelve by n hidden, which I think was two fifty six. Yeah. Okay. So we can grab the size and unpack it into each of these sequence length, batch size, num hidden. Um, Our target yt dot size is five twelve by eight, where else this one here was eight by five twelve. So to make them match, we're going to have to transpose the first two axes. Okay. Um, PyTorch, when you do something like transpose. Doesn't generally actually shuffle the memory order, but instead it just kind of keeps some internal metadata to say like, hey, you should treat this as if it's transposed. Um, and some things in PyTorch will give you an error if you try and use it when it has these like this internal state. Um, and it'll basically say uh, error: this tensor is not contiguous. If you ever see that error. 
add the word contiguous after it and it goes away. So I don't know, they can't do that for you apparently. So in this particular case I got that error, so I wrote the word contiguous after it. Okay, and so then finally we need to flatten it out into a single vector and so we can just go dot view, which is the same as numpy dot reshape, and minus one means as long as it needs to be. Okay, and then uh, the input again we also reshape that, right? But remember the input, sorry, the uh, the uh, the the predictions um, also have this axis of length 84, all of the predicted probabilities. Okay, so so here's a custom here's a custom loss function. That's it, right? So if you ever want to play around with your own loss functions, you can just do that like so, and then pass that to fit. Right? So it's important to remember that fit is this like lowest level fast AI abstraction, you know, that sits that this is the thing that implements the training loop. Okay? And so like your the stuff you pass it in is all standard PyTorch stuff, except for this. This is our model data object. This is the thing that wraps up the test set, uh, the training set, and the validation set together. Okay? Yannette, could you pass that back, please? So when we pull the triangle into the uh, repetitive structure, right? Um, so the the first n minus one iterations of the sequence length, we don't see the whole sequence length. Yeah. So does that mean that the batch size should be much bigger, so that you get a triangular kind of? Uh, now be careful. You don't mean batch size. You mean sequence length, right? Because yeah. the batch size is like something Across, else entirely. Right. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. So yes, yes. If you have a short sequence length like eight, yeah, the first character has nothing to go on. It starts with um, an empty hidden state of zeros. Right. So what we're going to start with next week is we're going to learn how to avoid that problem, right? And so that's a really insightful question or concern, right? And but if you think about it, the basic idea is why should we reset this to zero every time? You know, like if we can kind of line up these mini batches somehow so that the next mini batch joins up correctly, it represents like the next letter in Nietzsche's works, then we'd want to move this up into the constructor, right? And then like pass that here, and then store it here, right? And now we're not resetting the hidden state each time, we're actually we're actually keeping the hidden state from call to call, and so the only um, time that it would be failing to benefit from learning state would be like literally at the very start of the document. So that's where we're that's where we're going to try and head next week. I feel like this lesson, every time I've got a punchline coming, somebody asks me a question where I have to like do the punchline ahead of time. Uh, okay, so we can fit that, and we can fit that, um, and I want to show you something interesting, and this is coming to um, the punchline that another punchline that Yannette tried to spoil, which is um, when we're, uh, you know, remember this is just doing a loop. Right, applying the same matrix multiply again and again. Um, if that matrix multiply tends to increase the activations each time, then effectively we're doing that to the power of eight. Right, so it's going to like shoot off really high. Or if it's decreasing it a little bit each time, it's going to shoot off really low. And so this is what we call a gradient explosion. Right, and so we really want to make sure that the initial H, uh, not H, the initial, what do we call it? The initial L hidden that we create is, is like of a size that's not going to cause our activations on average to increase or decrease. Right? And there's actually a very nice matrix that does exactly that called the identity matrix. 
So the identity matrix for those that don't quite remember their linear algebra Is this? This would be a size 3 identity matrix All right, and so <clears throat> The trick about an identity matrix is anything times an identity matrix is itself right and so therefore you could multiply by this again and again and again and again and still end up with itself right so there's no gradient explosion um, So what we could do is instead of using whatever the default Random in it is for this matrix We could instead after we create our RNN is we can go into that RNN right and notice this right we can go m dot RNN right and if we now go Like so we can get the docs for m dot RNN Right? And as well as the arguments for constructing it it also tells you the inputs and outputs for calling the layer And it also tells you the attributes and so it tells you there's something called Weight HH and these are the learnable hidden to hidden weights. That's that square matrix Right, so after we've constructed our M we can just go in and say all right M dot RNN dot weight HHL Dot data that's the tensor dot copy underscore in place Torch dot I that is I for identity in case you are wondering um, So this is an identity matrix of size n hidden so this both puts into this weight matrix and returns the identity matrix and so this was like actually a Jeffrey Hinton paper Was like, hey, you know, after what is this 2015? So after um, recurrent neural nets have been around for decades, he was like, uh, hey gang, maybe we should just use the identity matrix to initialize this, and like, it actually turns out to work really well. Um, and so that was a 2015 paper, believe it or not, uh, from the father of neural networks. And so here is the here is our implementation of his paper. And this is an important thing to note, right? When very famous people like Jeffrey Hinton write a paper, sometimes an entire implementation of that paper looks like one line of code. Okay, so let's do it. Um, before we got point six one two five seven, uh, we'll fit it with exactly the same parameters, and now. We got 0.51 and in fact we can keep training 0.50. So like this tweak really 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 helped Right um, and one of the nice things about this tweak was before I could only use a learning rate of 1 in egg 3 Before it started going crazy, but after I used the identity matrix I found I could use 1 in egg 2 Because it's you know, it's better behaved weight initialization. I found I could use a higher learning rate All Right. I mean honestly these things um, you know increasingly we're trying to incorporate into the defaults in fast AI you, you know you don't won't necessarily increasingly need to actually know them, but you know at this point um, we're, st we're still at a point where you know most things in most libraries most of the time don't have great defaults It's good to know all these little tricks. It's also nice to know if you want to improve something What kind of tricks people have used elsewhere because you can often borrow them yourself? All right um, well, that's the end of the lesson today, and so next week we will uh, Look at this idea of a stateful RNN that's going to keep its hidden state around and then we're going to go back uh, To looking at language models again, and then finally we're going to go all the way back to computer vision and learn about things like ResNets and batch norm and all the tricks that were in figured out in cats versus dogs. See you then